<clears throat> it wasn't always this way. This knocking inside my brain, my devotion to the dark interior of things, this crashing at the easy days motel and spending my daylight hours drinking tequila in the muggy belly of any bar that'll still let me in. I used to have a two-story house in suburbia. Yeah, a husband who shared my bed and loved to fall asleep holding my hand. And I had you, Clara, my precious strawberry blonde daughter, ticklish, conceived on a beach in Bora Bora. I just couldn't help myself that day. I had to see for myself. I, I, I can't explain it, except there was this turmoil in my gut and these pictures in my brain twirling. And, and, and so I walked out of our cozy nest of a house and into the sun, head down, floppy maroon hat low on my head, almost over my eyes, towards Anita's house. I wouldn't be gone long. 20 minutes tops, just a heartbeat in the scheme of things. You'd be fine taking your nap in the playroom with Scooby-Doo on TV just in case you woke up before I got back. <laughs> what? what if we had sensors in our skin, huh? That could tell us if people were lying? We'd probably have constant, never-ending goosebumps because we lie to ourselves even more probably than others lie to us. It's just stupid, stupid, stupid. So anyway, I hurried, I hurried, I heart racing and goose bumpy, wondering if the neighbors could tell it was me and I, I knew where he was. My husband, your daddy, his sleek new black Mercedes parked two blocks away around the corner, damn him. Damn him slinking like a coyote in heat through her back gate. I tried not to think about where and what I was heading for, but the harder I tried, the harder I thought about it. Oh my God, there was a bounty of hydrangeas in Anita's yard. Flowers the size of small soccer balls. She must have fed them blood or bones or maybe she even dyed them. Like her hair, obvious, such a striking shade of red like blood oranges. Your daddy was fond of saying that red was trashy. Insisted that I stay mousy brown. I snuck around the bushes, leaving my dignity in, on the sidewalk, scuffing my shoes on the side of the basement window up, up, over the sill, because what could be worse than what I was imagining? Of course, people all the time are telling me, you know, you don't live in the past or the future, just this moment right here, because it's all we really have. And most likely, we should also say what's on our minds right here, right now, too, which seems absolutely righteous and absolutely impossible. And it's reminded me of a song, except I can't quite remember it. Um, it's, um, oh yeah, it, um, no, lost it. Like I lost a lot of things in the near past, including 30 pounds and therefore my tits. <laughs> <laughs> which your daddy just loved. <laughs> His personal Dolly Partons <laughs> claimed that when he met me in high school he didn't see my face for the first six months. <laughs> so mesmerized by my boobs he was. Well now they're gone. Two. We should be celebrating your 16th birthday today. You'd be able to understand things. And we'd talk strolling through the Museum of Modern Art, he at the Biltmore, and later in the shade of an oak tree sitting on a bench on the edges of dusk. You'd turn to me and you'd thank me for loving you most. I gotta give my baby a sweet 16 present. <laughs> Cause I can't live if I don't. See, 
through that window, I was, I was watching him put his hand on Anita's cheek. Lays it there so tenderly like she's made of blown glass. And touching me like a craftsman toolbox. <laughs> Her fake nails too red, like a fire engine. Nails would, would make it impossible to do dishes or play piano type, change a diaper. And she scratches him. She takes him. She scratches him from his neck all the way down his back to his butt. Okay, okay, what? N now suddenly he likes that kind of thing? Apparently, yes, because he's squirming and he's moaning. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, so loud that I can hear it through the walls. What happened to just lay there? Don't do anything. Don't touch me there, there, there in the dark of our bedroom on the second floor of our home. My stubby nails are digging into the termite-riddled wood of the sill, and I'm thinking, so this is what I've become? The queen of his heart is now just a piece of cold granite hanging on a wall? Jesus, wake up! Wake up, wake up, wake up! That's the name of the song I was trying to think of. And I guess that you were waking up from your nap early because... And maybe it was at the same time that I was waking up to the disastrous state of my marriage and you walked out of the house, probably looking for me, calling for your mommy, most likely crying, wailing, even you did that sometimes, scared. We had walked past Lenny, old man McGuire's house so many times when we took our evening strolls. His tidy brick house across the street with a wraparound porch and a basement. And he'd sit on the front porch and he'd, he'd throw us a howdy-do, naming us the neighborhood sunflowers. You would have never considered Lenny a stranger. Hell, I never thought that, that, he, that, that he, you'd ever come across him without me being right there. If he told us about that, that new litter of kittens in the basement said that we should stop by and see them sometime, and I said, okay, it's just something you say. He disappeared the same day you did. They found a single strawberry blonde hair. Yours? caught on a button of one of his shirts that he left behind. We got no real evidence, just circumstantial. Detective Johnston standing wooden-faced in my living room, pulling the curtain back to examine Lenny's perfect lawn, his empty driveway, where he parked his blue Plymouth station wagon that they never found either. And where was I, for God's sake? The detective wondered out loud. And then he turned and he looked down his snout at me and that look. Worse than the prison bars they put me behind. Child endangerment. Shit. Where I was, of course, was hanging on a window ledge watching them going all the way, her dress up around her waist, which was thicker than mine, just for the record, and her skin, it was colorless, except for the faint purple birthmark up high on her, her, her hip, and she's ready for it. Oh, she's ready for it, his larger-than-life snake in the grass, and he looks up. What, does he sense that I'm there? Seeing his black heart, his tongue in her mouth, what is that, a, a moment of remorse before he plunges into the ruination of what we always called our sweet everything? Since that day, I'm just a bat in a cave, hanging upside down and angry at the dawn for rising, flowers for blooming, men for walking away from trouble, or goddamn taking the little girls. I rubbed a hole in the palm of my hand while doing my 10 years in prison for child endangerment in my heart. My heart is just festered. What kind of person makes an angel cry? That's what I want to know. Your daddy 
has this beautiful dark spot on his shoulder. I used to love to kiss tangled sheets, sultry summer evenings, and you had a spot too just like it, except it was on your right shoulder and paler and more, more delicate. Me? All I have is this handgun in my pocket and a folded list of names I got off the internet. Apparently there are 30 sex offenders living in a five mile radius of the EZ Days Motel and one of them is an El McGuire and he lives at 850 Grant Apartment 16. And I am going to push the buzzer, I'm going to wait at the bottom of the steps, and when I see him, I'm going to smile like an angel, and he's going to be surprised, possibly he's going to be thrilled, and I'm going to throw him a howdy-do, and then I'm going to cry, Pop goes the weasel! That was your favorite nursery rhyme. And then I'm going to pull the trigger. Okay, okay. Maybe it's not the Lenny old man McGuire, but it is your birthday, Clara. Happy sweet 16th.